Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Today I'd like to continue looking at op-amp circuits with the diode in the feedback loop and discuss the precision rectifier. The idea here is that we will take some voltage, varying arbitrarily over time, and generate an output voltage that follows the input when it's positive, but gets clamped to ground when it's negative. Now, if we had ideal components, we could simply take our input signal and pass it through a diode with a resistor to ground. The voltage at the top of the resistor would be the signal we need. Of course, we don't live in an ideal world. The first issue we will have to contend with is that the diode has a forward voltage drop, so our positive output will always be too low by that amount. But it gets worse. The signal source will have some non-zero resistance, and so will the load. These will function as a voltage divider, knocking down the output still further. We can see all this when I set it up on the breadboard. I have a 1K resistor in series with the input from my function generator, so that I can demonstrate with a higher impedance source. There's a diode in series with the input, and I can select a 10K or 1K resistor to ground to vary the load resistance. There are scope probes monitoring the input and output. With the higher impedance source, I'm seeing the signal follow the input with about one diode drop of loss. But when I switch to a 1K load, we lose half the remaining signal. Of course, we can get it back with a low impedance source but we don't always have a low impedance source. Before we continue, let me make a brief interruption. Many of you know that my content is never paywalled and is free for anyone to learn from. I never beg for money to support the channel, but I do ask something important, that you take care of one another. To that end, the advertising revenue from this YouTube channel goes to charity. My March 2025 payment has gone to the Get Fed Up campaign of Save the Children. The campaign has a single mission, fighting childhood hunger. Of course, that fight has more benefits, because the prosperity of a community depends on education, and you can't fill a child's brain when a child has an empty belly. But more important, I want children to be able to play and dream about their future without worrying where their next meal will come from. I know that Kevin's Cave people are a kind and generous lot, so I'm urging you to join me in supporting this organization using the affiliate link up here or down there or at any rate somewhere nearby. I've set a relatively modest goal of 500 bucks. If even 1% of my subscribers were to give 10 bucks a piece, we'd meet that goal and feed a classroom of 30 hungry kids for a week. I hope that instead, we'll just crush it. Won't you help out today? This is another example of something we discussed a couple of episodes ago. It's as if we have a slimy green monster in the middle of our circuit, distorting the waveform that we want. But we know how to hide the monster. We use the magic of negative feedback and enclose our monster in the feedback loop of an op-amp. In a flash, We've solved the problem of input impedance, and we should have solved the problem of the diode drop, because when the diode is conducting, the op-amp will try to hold its two inputs equal. The output voltage of the op-amp will simply be a diode drop above the input voltage, so that the other end of the diode has a voltage equal to the input voltage. But we had better look and make sure things are all right when the diode isn't conducting. In that case, the pull-down resistor will make the output voltage zero, the input voltage is, of course, negative. The op-amp will try to make the inputs equal, but the feedback loop is broken. The output voltage will swing all the way to the negative rail. Which is all right, because that will keep the diode from conducting and the circuit is stable. When the diode is on, the feedback loop will make the effective output impedance nearly zero. That's good. But when the diode is off, the only thing that can source or sink current to the output is the pull-down resistor. If the load is returned to anywhere but ground, that might be an issue. But if need be, we can take care of that by simply adding a voltage follower. 
I've set the new circuit up here on the breadboard with the diode resistor combination here and scope probes looking at the input and output. I like what I see on the scope, but that's with a 1 kilohertz input signal. What if I upped it to 20 kilohertz? There were horrible glitches at the zero crossings of the input signal. To understand what's going on, I hooked a third scope probe up to the op-vamp output at the anode of the diode. It's the purple trace on the screen. And it's not too hard to see the major problem, which happens when the input wave crosses the axis in the positive direction. The output starts up a little bit. I think this is the result of crosstalk or possibly poor power supply decoupling. But at any rate, the output signal is below the level it ought to be until it suddenly jumps up to the correct level. There's the same artifact from crosstalk or decoupling of the negative going crossing, and I'm going to ignore that for now and focus on the big jump. If we look at the op-amp output, we can see the problem. It takes the output a certain amount of time to climb from the negative rail to half a diode drop above the input. It took about a microsecond and a half to climb the 13 volts or so. Then the diode started conducting, and the output jumped to the correct level. The time for the output to climb or descend after a sudden voltage jump is governed by a datasheet parameter that we haven't looked at yet, the slew rate. It's a parameter that you'll probably care about if you're designing something like a pulse generator or square wave oscillator. For the TL072B op amp that I used, the minimum slew rate that the datasheet promises is 8 volts per microsecond. That's pretty close to what I saw, about a microsecond and a half to make a sudden 13 volt jump. And the TL072B is one of the faster ones among the cheap op amps. There are much faster ones out there, but they're quite a bit more expensive and often sacrifice other parameters such as input noise, offset voltage, and most important, stability. Many fast op amps will oscillate in a unity gain circuit like this. But we have some more tricks up our collective sleeve. What we need to do is make sure that the op amp never needs to make a huge voltage swing. We must keep it from ever going into saturation. The easiest way to do that is to use an inverting configuration for the op amp and use a second diode to limit the negative voltage swing. The circuit looks like this. It might not be obvious at first what's going on, so let's take it step by step. To start with, remember that the inverting input of the op amp will be a virtual ground as long as the feedback loop is working. What happens if the input voltage is above ground? There will be a current flowing through the input resistor toward the virtual ground. There needs to be an equal and opposite current flowing out of the virtual ground. We assume op amp inputs draw no current, and the bottom diode won't pass current in that direction. So all the current has to be flowing through the top diode and the feedback resistor. For the currents to balance, the output voltage has to be the negative of the input voltage, since the input and feedback resistor are equal. The op-amp's output needs to be one diode drop below that. If, instead, we give the circuit an input voltage below ground, then of course the current in the input resistor will flow in the opposite direction. Now it's the top diode that can't provide the balancing current. It will flow through the bottom diode instead. That will place the output of the op-amp at one diode drop above ground, which is at least one diode drop above the input signal, confirming that the top diode will be turned off hard. With that diode turned off, looking back into the output port sees only a resistor to the virtual ground, so the output voltage is zero. At the zero crossings, Rather than slamming into a supply rail, the op-amp output needs to jump only two diode drops. If we want to minimize that jump even more, we can use Schottky diodes here. The circuit's output voltage is the same as the previous precision rectifier, only inverted. Since the output impedance is rather high when the input voltage is negative, we still need an output buffer. We can replace the unity gain buffer from the previous design with a unity gain inverter, so that our output will still be positive going. 
Let's go to the breadboard and try out this version. Here I've made the necessary circuit changes, with a diode directly from the op amp output back to the input, and a diode in the opposite direction to the 10K feedback resistor. Looking at the inverting output signal, it looks like a clean, rectified version of the input, only upside down. The op amp output on the blue trace shows that it clamps at one diode drop rather than swinging to a supply rail. Even when I bump the frequency to 20 kHz, the glitches are just about gone. There's a tiny jump in the output where the input makes its positive going zero crossing, but it's almost undetectable. Moving to the output of the inverting buffer. It overlays almost perfectly on the positive half of the input signal. The slight mismatch is due to resistor tolerances and op-amp offsets, and we looked at a few approaches to improving our precision in the last episode on difference amplifiers. Even at 20 kHz, the glitches that played to the previous design are just about gone. There's one more thing that I want to do to this rectifier. I'll add two more 10K resistors. One of them is simply in parallel with the input resistor of the inverter, making the resistance 5K instead of 10K. If I were to leave it there, we'd have a half-wave rectifier with a gain of 2. But I'm also going to add a 10K resistor from the circuit input. That will subtract the original input signal from the result. Let's see what that gives us. The output voltage is the inverted input voltage, plus twice the rectified input voltage. If we move the negative V sub in into the cases, we get that the output voltage is V sub in when V sub in is positive, and negative V sub in when V sub in is negative. But that's the definition of absolute value. At the cost of two more equal valued resistors, we've made our half-wave rectifier into a full-wave rectifier, also called an absolute value circuit. Let's try it. Here it is on the breadboard. I've added a second 10K feedback resistor in parallel with the first, and added the resistor from the circuit input to the input of the inverter, which is now an adder. When I turn it on, there's nearly a perfect full-wave rectified signal. I'll boost the frequency to 20 kHz again. And now there's a different glitch at the crossovers. What's going on now is that the rectified signal is very slightly delayed with respect to the input signal. If I had to worry about it, I equalize the delays, possibly by deriving the output by summing the outputs of two half-wave precision rectifiers. But glitches of such low intensity and duration are something that we likely won't care about in audio. They're well beyond the range of human hearing. In this episode, we've seen useful circuits for rectifying an input signal, either by clamping it to ground, that is, a half-wave rectifier, or by taking its absolute value, a full-wave rectifier. Equally importantly, we've learned about op amp slew rate, that the performance of a circuit can be limited by how fast an op amp's output voltage can change. In particular, we've seen a circuit whose overall output doesn't make rapid changes, but whose performance is limited by op amp slew rate on some intermediate signal. When doing signal processing circuits like these, it's important to watch out for intermediate signals that might make rapid swings, and it may be necessary to take action to limit those swings. Next time in this series, I'll add a capacitor to the diodes in the loop and look at peak detection circuits. I hope you'll stay tuned for that, and perhaps think about telling the YouTube algorithm that you want to see it. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!